Happy New Year, one and all. Happy New Year. As our call to worship this morning, let's stand and read these verses from Psalm 118 responsively. Thank God because he's good. Because his love never quits. Tell the world, Israel. His love never quits. And you, clan of Aaron, tell the world. His love never quits. And you who fear God, join in. His love never quits. Pushed to the wall, I called to God, and from the wide open spaces he answered, God is now at my side, and I'm not afraid. Who would dare lay a hand on me? God's my strong champion. I flick off enemies like flies. Far better to take refuge in God than trust in people. Far better to take refuge in God than trust in celebrities. God's my strength. He's also my song. And now he's my salvation. And now I'm telling the world what God did. God tested me. He pushed me hard, but he didn't hand me over to death. Swing wide, city gates, the righteous gates. I'll walk right through and thank God. Thank you for responding to me. You've truly become my salvation. The stone the masons discarded as flawed is now the capstone. This is God's work. We rub our eyes. We can hardly believe it. This is the very day God acted. Let's celebrate and be festive. Salvation now, God. Salvation now. Blessed are you who enter in God's name. From God's house, we bless you. God is God. He has bathed us in light. Adorn the shrine with garlands. Hang colored banners above the altar. You are my God, and I thank you. O oh my God, I lift high your praise. Thank God. He is so good. His love never quits.
while I began today with greeting you in a happy new year, this last year, our banner was embrace suffering for the glory of God. And so I think we're happy that we're rolling into a new year. <laughs> Some of you have had a real challenge embracing what life has thrown at you this year. Some of you have had a handshake with grief. Some of you have been buried with it. But in all of it, we have learned more about how what happens in our life and how we choose to respond brings glory to God. That is a lesson we take into the new year. As we go full cycle, and our theme now is going to be in being immersed in the Bible. We're getting back into the word and soaking in it as we are immersed again. But we will go forward grateful he has brought us safe thus far. And for all he has done for us, for all he promises yet to do, we give him thanks. <coughs> Your grace will song we introduced to you this past Christmas, and we've sung it a couple of times today. I invite you to sing it along with us. It's called the Advent Hymn, not so much because of Christmas, but because of the idea of Advent, Christ coming, and Christ coming again, and how the watching and the waiting and the longing is on both sides 
God is watching, waiting, and longing too. We don't often think of that. We're usually thinking of ourselves and our emotions. But this song invites us to look at both sides of eternity and pray for the day when they become one. Let's stand and sing together.
You may be seated. If you'd like to turn with me in your Bibles as we read from the book of John. When I get there, John chapter 5, verses 24 and 25. John writes, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message, and this is Jesus, and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. And I assure you that the time is coming. Indeed, the time is here now. When the dead will hear my voice, the voice of the Son of God. And those who listen will live. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, as we look to your word today, And look to the subject that you've given me to speak on and that you're going to speak to us about through me. Lord God, I pray that we would realize it is now. It is now. It is today. Father, give me the words to speak this morning. And may those words touch each and every one of our hearts to wake us up to how real you are and to how now you are. Not something in the future, but today is the day, as we'll talk about, of the Lord. Father God, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I should have stopped and prayed for all of us who are fighting colds because I think everybody has have had the cold or is still battling that, and uh, it seems that the cold this time of year is not wanting to uh, go in any way. It probably doesn't help that uh, the weather's been such where we've gone from nice warm times to (laughs) to freezing, (laughs) or last weekend, right? Anyway, I know that many of you have probably made some New Year's resolutions, some promises to yourself. But my question today is, those promises to change, because a lot of times we make the same promise, when are they going to actually happen in our lives? When are we actually going to follow through? Is it this year? Is it this decade? Or is it never? Seems that we make New Year's resolutions, but we really never keep them. Everyone has an area that we want to improve in our lives, from maybe our diets to exercise to all of those things. But it's getting around to it. That is frustrating, isn't it? Making it happen. So many resolutions will putter out in the next few weeks, won't they? We've, this week started, I read somebody who started their New Year's resolution uh, on Christmas Day or last week, uh, had already started trying to do things, and I'm reading this stuff that they're doing, and, and it sounds really great, but I'll guarantee by the end of January, when life starts filling in, that unfortunately, It'll break down. But in this case, maybe fortunately, because what they're trying to do is kind of some uh, Middle Eastern kind of stuff, which uh, isn't going to really help anyway. The question that we may all have is, is that is genuine change even possible in our lives? If small changes like diet and stuff like that, exercise, not really big changes, seem to elude us, what about transformation? Jesus, of course, describes salvation as a rebirth, a a born-again experience. It is like starting over again when we give our heart and life and soul to Jesus Christ. The Bible says dramatic conversions are possible. 
Uh, but the problem is we start throwing our own understanding of that in there. And maybe it gets in the way. It's got truth, but it may get in the way of all that that can mean. We say salvation means, well, we're going to heaven. I believe in Jesus and he forgives me. We've been forgiven. And in heaven, I will be perfect and everything else will be perfect around me. And in heaven, I will know God intimately. I'll have this intimate time with God and all my questions will be answered and all my needs will be met. But along with that, we say things like, and think things like heaven is kind of far off, especially if we're younger. And in the meantime, we are just puttering around here on earth. We're not really doing anything. Spiritually, we make that decision and then we just kind of hang in there. We don't make the changes. We don't expect much in our life to change. And because we don't expect anything to change, it doesn't. If you want it to change, you've got to expect it to change. You know, and these are kind of skewed. Uh, The the, um, statistics from 2021, the pandemic, I think, kind of skews some of these things. But I'm going to give the latest statistics here. Uh, 59% of Canadians still believe in a God. Now, notice I said a God. A higher power. Indeed, as many as 53% believe and still say that they are Christian. So believe in a Christian God. Approximately a third of those say they are Christian, claim a new birth experience. In other words, claim to be born again. But these figures are actually shocking when compared to to the statistics for that same group regarding unethical behavior, crime, mental distress and disorder, family failures, addiction and financial misdealings and the like. Because they tend to pair parody or whatever the right word is there with the rest of the world. Doesn't seem to be a change when somebody says that they are born again. Could such a combination of profession and failure really be the life and life abundantly that Jesus came to give us? I don't think so. So one of the questions we should ask is, well, how did Jesus, how did Jesus view salvation? Well, he says salvation is, is being part of the king, God's kingdom, the kingdom of God. Well, what's that? The kingdom of God is any place where God, the Almighty, is king. That's the kingdom of God. It is already on this earth. The disciples of Jesus are its citizens, and we would be say that we have God living in us, in the Holy Spirit, and thus the kingdom of God is in each and every one of us who believe in Jesus. And they obey their king and serve him with wherever they are. The kingdom of God, though, is bigger than our petty religious schemes. You know, it's more than giving up cigarettes for God, it's more than sending money to charities. For a matter of fact, it's more than me. Period. It's more than us. Salvation is not for a distant future either. See, salvation is for right now. Not when we get to heaven or all of that. It's For now. Transformation begins the moment we believe in Jesus Christ. The moment we put our faith and our hope and our trust in Jesus. John tells us in 524, he says, uh, moment you believe you have eternal life, we have already crossed over from death to life. We don't have to wait for the future heaven. 
The moment you believe, you've already crossed over into the kingdom of God. Though there will be a heaven, I'm not trying to tell you and that there won't be those places. See, God is God of now. God is the God of now. We, should have, we shouldn't have to wait for, for heaven to have a relationship with God. So many Christians seem to be doing that. We shouldn't have to wait for heaven to become the kind of people he would have us to be. Salvation is an everyday experience. Forgiveness is only one aspect of it. See, we often make forgiveness the end of it all. That's it. We have bumper stickers that say, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. Just forgiven? And is that really all there is to being a Christian? The gift of eternal life comes down to that, just forgiven? Hopefully you don't believe that. We have a bumper sticker theology. And see, that bumper sticker theology has leaped from the traffic. It's leaped into Christian trinkets. It's leaped onto the internet and the Facebook and all of that. We see things like bookmarks adorned with flowers and bows and uh, green sprigs and 14 tiny pink hearts with tassel on the top of it. You can just picture that. or, Or you've seen the picture of that on Facebook. And the message below is, as you, wait a sec, and in the center of all that, I've got to get everything I'm saying here, adorned with the flowers, in the center of that is a bear who looks as if he might have inadvertently just done something naughty. It's cute. But the message below it is, and as you now would expect me to say, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. Just forgiven? Well, it certainly needs to be said that Christians are forgiven, that if you've given your heart to Jesus, completely given your life to Christ, you are forgiven. It's forgiven. And it needs to be said that forgiveness does not depend on me being perfect. God takes us the way we are. If you're waiting until you're perfect to give your heart to Jesus, well, you're never going to give your heart to Jesus. That said, but is that what that slogan is really communicating to us? Unfortunately, it is not. What the slogan really conveys is that forgiveness alone is what Christians, Christianity is all about. Is that what it's all about? It says that you can have a faith in Christ that brings forgiveness while in every other respect, your life is no different from that of others who have no faith in Christ at all. That's what that statement is saying. And unfortunately, we've bought into the statement, people have, Christians have, and their life isn't any different. See, Jesus taught us, and John writes about it in John 15, talking about the vine and the branches, and I'm not going to spend a whole time on this. We may in the future. But John writes, and these are the words of Jesus. I am the true grapevine. And my father is the gardener. We here in Dunville should know a little something about grapes. We live very close to Niagara. And grape capital of Canada, if we want to put it that way, or at least for now. Uh, I'm not sure that Prince Edward County isn't coming up fast to try to replace it. As we start building more homes down on the escarpment. So Jesus is the grapevine, and the Father is the gardener. He, verse 2 says, he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. 
So if that branch, if you're a branch that wasn't producing fruit, then Jesus, God has cut you off from Christ. You no longer have the the life-flowing blood of Jesus Christ running through your veins. And for the rest of us, he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. We talked about the fruit, the fruit of God's spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the self-control, etc. that God gives us, that we should be uh, exemplifying in our lives. You've been pruned and and purified by the message that I have given you. So remain in me and I will remain in you. There's a promise. If we remain in Jesus, Jesus will remain in us. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Makes sense to me, doesn't it? Maybe your life isn't fruitful because you haven't remained in Jesus. Jesus goes on to say, yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, and you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to the Father, he writes. He goes on to say, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. So if we're followers of Jesus, Jesus is telling us that we need to remain in his truths, in his law. There's not this, oh, this is, was Old Testament and this was new. And yes, we can be forgiven for breaking some of that, But we need to remain in it. It needs to be our goal to become Christ-like. That's why you're a Christian. It is to become Christ-like. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. How did God love us? How did Jesus love us? He was willing to lay down his life for ours. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't uh, confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends. And since I have told you everything the Father told me, you don't choose me. I choose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. So that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love each other. Then Jesus talks about living in this world. He says, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you are no longer part of the world. I choose you to come out of the world so it hates you. People, we're not to be of the world. We're not to try to move so we can be more like the world. We need to make the world more like us, more like Jesus Christ. 
Do you remember what I told you, Jesus writes? A slave is not greater than the master since they persecuted me. Naturally, they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. They will do all this to you because of me, for they have rejected the one who sent me. They would not be guilty if I had not come and spoken to them. But now they have no excuse for their sin. You see, the world, you personally, don't have any excuse for your sin. The world has no excuse. We have no excuses for the sins of this world because Jesus has been seen by the world. There are very few spots in this world today where Christ has not been preached. A few, but not many. They're getting less and less every day. Anyone who hates me also hates the Father. If I hadn't done such miraculous signs among them that no one else could do, they would not be guilty. But as it is, they have seen everything I did, yet they still hate me and my Father. This fulfills what is written in their scriptures. They hated me without cause. But I will send you an advocate, the Spirit of God, praise the Lord. And he will come to you from the Father and will testify about me. And you must also testify about me because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. Now there's lots in that passage we could stop and talk about. But I want you to get this, that I'm forgiven, you're forgiven for a purpose. And that purpose, as uh, is taught to us, is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why we're saved. That we would have that relationship with Jesus Christ. We're forgiven that we would follow him day by day. Not just when we choose. Not just for an hour or hour and a half on Sunday mornings. But every moment of every day. And we're there to communicate with him about every experience of our life. We could talk to God about it. Now, you could take it to a dramatic degree, like Frank Laubach's experience. Uh, For those that don't know him, he was a missionary to the Philippines back in the 30s, 1930s. It's not a future uh, prediction here. He chose a very difficult mission field. He was a missionary to the Moros, uh, which are Muslim, who were Muslim at the time. Uh, They saw Christians, of course, as their enemies. Frank Laubach was a missionary there in the 1930s. And Laubach, however, had a different mission. His goal was to teach the Moros to be able to read. Like a lot of people in those days, they couldn't read. It is established that he was able to educate one half of the 90,000 people in that area. So that's 45,000 people that he educated. And more than that, he brought thousands of those people to a genuine experience of God. Even though he was there to teach them how to read. He did this with a heart that was filled with the presence of God. In January of 1930, he began to cultivate the habit of turning his mind to Christ for one second out of every minute. He looked to God. After only four weeks, he reported, I feel simply carried along each hour doing my part in the plan which is far beyond myself. This sense of cooperation with God is a little thing in, in, in little things is what's so astonishing to me. For I never have felt it like this before, he wrote. 
I need something and I turn around and it's there. It's waiting for me. I must work to be sure, but there is God working right alongside. See, Christianity, people, is more, it's not primary morality and politics, as some would like to preach and some would like to teach us, and we see a lot if we turn on our American brothers. You see, it's knowing Jesus. That's Christianity. Knowing Jesus. Hebrews tells us in 12, 2, to fix your eyes on him. It says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who, in, who initiates and perfects our faith. See, it's Jesus that even initiates my faith. It's not me. It's Jesus. And it's Jesus that perfects my faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarded its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. And Jesus is working there on our behalf. So what can we experience as Christians now? Not as we keep looking at it in the future when we get to heaven. Well, we can look at a moral transformation we can be transformed. Stuart Briscoe, he once challenged his congregation. I'll make the same challenge with these words. He says, the Bible says we're being changed from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. That's what it says. Do you know what you ought to be able to do at the end of the year? You ought to be able to look back and see some specific ways in which you have grown spiritually. There ought to be evidence, he writes, of a new habits, new attitudes, new abilities, relating directly to the fact that you're being changed by the Spirit of God, no matter how old you are or how young you are. Can you think of one overwhelming weakness that had you by the throat at the beginning of this year, or maybe has you by the throat right now at the beginning of this year. Do you honestly believe that if Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, came into your life, he could release you from it? Do you believe that? I hear a lot of people paying lip service to that, but I'm not sure that they believe it because their actions don't prove it. He goes on to write, he could release you from it, and you could live in a newness of life. You say, I don't know about that. Nothing is impossible with God. If it is part of his divine will, it resets, it rests well within his divine capabilities, people. There's nothing that God can't change. You see, in Jesus, when I place my life in Jesus, I can expect some things, experience some things. We can experience an intimacy with God, just like the missionary did, Loba. We can have intimacy with God. We can choose to talk to him and walk with him. Spend our time in prayer. Even if we're not at a prayer meeting, we don't have to be. We can be in prayer with God each and every moment of our life. As he said, I look to God for one second of one minute every day. And he talked about how it changes his life. We can experience a sense of fulfillment in our lives, even in this crazy world that we live in. And it's getting more crazy, or if I can put it that way. But we can experience that fulfillment in Jesus Christ. The question that I have for us today is, where have you experienced it? And if you haven't experienced it, 
Are you really walking with Jesus? Are you really a Christian? Or are you just playing at it? Covering all your bases? Have you surrendered to God? Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, now is the time of salvation. Now. Not when you're on your deathbed and getting to heaven. It's now. Now is the time of salvation. People, do we live like we are saved? Do you live like we are, you are saved? Because what we're going to do this year and what we want to do again is to remind you to get immersed in the word of God uh, that you might know him now, know him better. Tell Satan to get the excuses out of your head because the excuses I hear are just that, excuses, because there's no excuse that you can't be immersed in Scripture. If you can't read, you can turn on. uh, It's all over and somebody reads the Bible for you. Just get the U version of the Bible, as it's called. It's got many translations and everything. If you don't understand some translation, it'll give you another one. There's no excuse. There are books, there are, uh, in the daily breads that we give you, there's a whole Bible reading program. You don't even need to pick up the little green book, blue book, whatever color that is, that it's green, that we have around here to give you to read through the Bible in a year. But get to know God this year. Get to know him, not what, just what Pastor Peter has to say or uh, what John MacArthur has to say or uh, one of your favorite preachers out there has to say. But what does God say? Because you better make sure that I'm right when I'm saying what I say or these other guys are right or girls. And the other thing is that what we need to do, people, is live for him now. Live for him now. Not next week, next year, decade. You may not have that long. Or living for him when you get to heaven. Well, that's not what the Bible says, does it? That's not what Jesus commissioned us to do. Jesus said, go and make disciples. That's the calling of a Christian. To go and make disciples, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them the word, that they could go out and do the same. That's what the church is here for. Not only to spend an hour and a half worshiping him and falling asleep while the pastor is preaching. It's here that we could train you, teach you, send you out, work together on on bringing people to Christ, on looking after the poor and the hungry and the widows and the orphans and all of those things together. Because you know what? It's not about you. It's all about him. All about him. What is about you is that Jesus came to die for you, that you could have a relationship with him. Don't squander it. Don't squander it this year. Start it off right. Get into his word. Get into prayer. Spend time with other Christians. Living for him. Transforming this world for him. Because the problems that you can sit there and list, abortion, uh, you know, euthanasia, sexual sins that are out there, all of those things well, actually wouldn't be there if we brought people to a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. Because we know that we cannot continue to sin and be saved. That if I'm genuine forgiven, which I am, that I'm forgiven. And yes, I will slip and fall every once in a while, but I don't live in it. 
And if you're living in a sin, whatever that is, I mean, the Bible describes them all. You might not be obedient or loving to your parents. Now, I realize some of you have parents that aren't very easily to love, but we still need to have a loving heart towards them. And I know that it's not always easy to Oh, to love our prime minister or people like that. But we still need to love him. We may not agree with anything he does, but we still need to love him. And as much as we care for uh, the police officer that was killed, we also need to pray for those two lost people that killed him. Because they need Jesus. Jesus. And Jesus died for them just as much as he died for you. So start the year off right. Now is the time. Now is the day of salvation. Let's go forth in it. We're going to come to the table. Are we here first or are you singing? Okay. I'm going to ask the ushers to come, or the ushers, the elders to come and We're going to gather around this table to remember what Jesus has done for us. So as we gather at this table, as we've done throughout the last couple of years, we're going to invite you to come. We're going to invite you to come and get a cup. Now, you don't all have to come in your row. If somebody wants to come and pick up a cup for everybody in your row or for those beside you or somebody can't walk here, Uh, let us know or let the person beside you and you can pick a cup up for them. But come. But let me first ask us to bow our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus, we come to this, your table. And as we talk and we start a new year, what a more fitting way than to remember the sacrifice that you've made for all of us, that you made on that cross. But not only that, Lord, you overcame death that we might have life. You made the new covenant in your blood that whosoever believeth in you can have everlasting life. Father God, as we come to this table, help us to turn our hearts, if they're not already there, toward you. Help us to have hearts of thanksgiving, we pray in Jesus' name this morning. Amen. Come and receive a cup. trusting that everyone has gotten a cup that wants one. Matthew writes these words about the goings-on in the upper room and about what we're 
about to do. He writes, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup when they had given thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. People, we are so blessed. Not because that the baby was born, though the baby needed to be born. Not even because the baby walked this earth and taught us how we might live here and walk this earth, though that needed to be done. The greatest need that we all had was what Jesus did when he went to the cross. And that his body was broken for you and for me. When he gave up his life, that you and I might have life. That he took the beating and the whipping, the torture, and the humiliation of a death on the cross for us. That we might have everlasting life. And that the blood that flowed from his side would be the blood of the new covenant. A covenant that would wash us whiter well than snow, that four-letter word that we might have in our hearts. But even snow makes us everything look beautiful when it first falls. And Jesus makes us glisten far more than any of that beautiful snow over the weekend last week. He died for us so that you and I could have life. Let's bow our heads and give thanks for the table. Father God, we know that this isn't a Baptist table, it's not a denominational table. It's not even our own church table, O oh Lord. This is the table of the Lord. And as Paul records in Corinthians, Lord, this is for all who believe in your son, Jesus, who have made him Lord of their lives. And Lord, we give thanks to you. And we praise you on this first Sunday of the new year. And we look forward, as we said earlier in prayer, to whatever it is that this year brings. It may even bring your coming again. We don't know. But Lord, one thing we do know, that putting our faith and our trust in you has brought us the hope and the peace and the love that we so richly long for. So, Father God, I pray a blessing upon this table and upon all of the cups that are out there, O oh Lord, that as we drink of them in a few short minutes, Father, we will be reminded of your sacrifice, of your great love for us, the great hope for us and that our sins have been washed away. Father God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We read in Scripture that that night Jesus took the cup and he didn't have to worry about peeling the top off. But he took the cup or he took this cup, 
with a loaf of bread, is what I'm trying to say. It'll come out of my head as I peel this thing. They took this bread, and he said that this bread was to symbolize his body, which was broken for you and for me. I'm going to ask my brother Jeff to lead us in a prayer of thanksgiving for this bread. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for all we have. We thank you for your word, which tells us of this ceremony that we are observing today. It explains its purpose and helps us understand why we do this each month. Mm. We thank you for your great sacrifice of going through with this act of love for us. Help us to be obedient also and follow you. Help us to immerse ourselves in your word so that it may help us to be Help us to be obedient toward you. We ask these things and thank you for everything, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. The symbol of Christ's body that was broken for each and every one of us. Let's eat it in remembrance of the sacrifice Jesus made for each of us. Let's eat all of it. We also read in scripture that that night in the upper room, Jesus took the cup. And he said that this cup symbolized his blood. The blood that was shed for you and for me. The blood of the new covenant. And I'm going to ask our brother Jamie to lead us in prayer for this cup. Heavenly Father, it's not often that we uh, start the first of the year off with communion, and mm. uh, it's, it's kind of an appropriate way to start. Mm. And uh, as we think and look at this cup, we're reminded of your shed blood, which, of course, affords us the luxury of forgiveness. And I just ask that you would help us all to realize that we are forgiven. Amen. That we can walk in that forgiveness, and that frees us to serve you. Lord, the five pillars that we have gone through in the last few years, starting off with the word and then prayer and then preaching the gospel and then expecting miracles and then embracing suffering. None of those can happen if we don't first accept your forgiveness. Amen. Help us to do that this year, Lord, better than we've ever done it before. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. the symbol of Christ's blood that was shed for us. Let us rejoice in what Jesus has done. Let's bow our heads in prayer. I just feel like prayer. Father God, we are so blessed. As the song says that we, I can't even understand. We can't understand why you would bless us with the gift of Jesus because we don't deserve it. And yet, Father, we've drank of the, and ate of the bread, O oh Lord, drank of the cup, Father, And have felt your presence. And we just again want to say thank you. Thank you Lord for what you have done. Father may we be a blessing to you this year we pray. Amen. And amen. We're going to sing Jesus is coming again. Which he is people. His word tells us that he will come again for his church. Let's stand and sing this together.
Father God, we can't wait until that day when you come again. But until then, Lord, may your spirit go with each and every one who is here today. May it help them proclaim the saving grace of Jesus Christ. May it help them be witnesses for you. And may it keep them safe from this moment on and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.